Good morning, everybody, officially, and welcome to City Hall and to Council Chambers and a meeting of the Los Angeles City Council for today, Tuesday, January 15th, the years 2001 and 2002, excuse me. Uh, City Council meets every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday at 10 a.m., and you are all invited to join us and participate in council meetings here at City Hall. You can also watch us live from home on your cable station, channel 35, view us live via webcast from the city's homepage, or listen in on council phone. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Brinson, Galantra, Garcetti, Han, Holden, Labanche, Miskowski, Pacheco, Perry, Reyes, Ridley, Thomas, Weiss, Sign, Padilla, 11 members present in the quorum, Mr. President. Thank you very much. This being Tuesday, the first uh, council meeting of the week, uh, as part of our new uh, custom, we will call for uh, a moment of inspiration and a flag salute. Uh, let me uh, recognize the council member from the 15th district, Ms. Hahn, to introduce our special guest. Thank you, Mr. President. Today we have with us a very special guest to provide our moment of inspiration on a day that already cares, carries great meaning for all of us as we celebrate Dr. King's birthday. Fatia Wright is an eight-year-old honor student at Maria Regina School, located in Gardena, but she attends a church in my district, the Bethel Missionary Baptist Church at 109th and Compton. And Fatia is joined here this morning by her mother, Miss Felicia Harris, by her auntie, Dee Harris, by her grandmother, Everleen Johnson, and of course, we're always pleased to welcome the Reverend, the Reverend Reginald Pope, uh, pastor of the Bethel Missionary Baptist Church. At Fatia's school, their motto is, we share the spirit, and today she will share her spirit with us as she reenacts a part of Martin Luther King's most famous speech. Will you all please make Fatia welcome as she provides our moment of inspiration. Good morning. My name is Fatia Wright. I say to you today, my friends, that in spite of the difficulties and frustrations of the moment, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at a table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day the state of Mississippi, a desert state, sweltering in the heat of injustice and oppression will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my, four, that my four children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream that one day the state of Alabama, whose governor's lips are presently dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, will be transformed into a situation where little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls and walk together as sisters and brothers. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith with which I return to the South. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. 
With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discourse of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with a new many, my country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. So let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening algenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous peaks of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from the stone mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from the, from the lookout mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and molehill of Mississippi. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. When we let freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we'll, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we're free at last. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and Well, Mr. President, I think all members want to meet that future leader. Let her come down and meet all members. We, we need to know who she is. Be ready for the eighth. Yes, I believe uh, Council Member Hahn is going to uh, come around and introduce her to all members. And uh, while she does that, Madam Clerk, first order of business, please. Approval of the minutes. Mr. Ridley Thomas moves and uh, Ms. Hahn seconds. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Mr. Pacheco moves and uh, Ms. Perry seconds. On the regular agenda, uh, Mr. President, item number four is a confirmation of city officials, confirmation of Greg A. Wesley to the East LA Area Planning Commission. Okay, item number four, uh, if I can call the nominee forward. Public hearing has been held in committee on this item. Uh, any members wishing to be heard? <laughs> Item number four, confirmation of a uh, commissioner. Mr. Reyes. We did review uh, Mr. Wesley in committee, and uh, essentially he brings a lot of talent, a lot of heart to the committee, and uh, we just want to thank him for his good work and look forward to working with him in the future. Thank you, Councilman. Okay. Any other members wishing to be heard? 
Then uh, seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Congratulations. Thank you are you. confirmed. Forthwith. Thank you. Next item, please. On the regular agenda, items noticed for public hearings. Items one and two are uh, protest against proposed street lighting districts, and council should open the hearing and continue the hearing and ordinance to February 5th. Okay, item one and two are now before us, members. Uh, do not have requests from members of the public to be heard on these items. Uh, public hearing is opened, and without objection, continue to February 5th. Next item, Mr. President, item number three is a public hearing that's in Council District 3, and I believe uh, Council Member Zine has a motion. Uh, we also have a card on this item. Uh, Mr. Zine? Yes, uh, Mr. President, colleagues, I request that this item be continued to February 27th, and the reason for that request is that public notice was supposed to be sent to the surrounding area and that was not sent out by the city. We did not comply with that due to uh, some errors within one city department. So I'd request that it be continued to February 27th. Notices be uh, sent to the adjacent area as required. And this is a matter that has gone through court and we believe that this is in line with the wishes of the court that we have this continued to the 27th, so that would be my request. Okay, uh, Mr. Zion, since we do have just one card submitted by a member of the public, did you wish to hear this uh, gentleman today? I'm sorry, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Roger John Diamond has submitted a card. We can hear from him today or hear from him on the new date of council consideration. I hate to say this, I can't hear what you're saying. There's too much background noise. Okay, and without objection, we're gonna go ahead and hear from uh, Mr. Roger John Diamond. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this matter is an application for an exception under the zoning code. It's not a variance. Your agenda has an erroneous reference to this being an appeal on a variance. It's not a variance case, so your agenda should be corrected. But more importantly, this case began when my client applied to the city for an exception under the zoning code to allow dancers to remove their tops in dance topless at a facility on Oxnard Street in the Tarzana area of the city of Los Angeles. To do this, an exception had to be granted under the code. A hearing was held by the zoning administrator, and as a result of that hearing, a public hearing in Tarzana, the zoning administrator voted to deny the application for the exception. We appealed to the Board of Zoning Appeals, and the board affirmed the denial. We then appealed to the city council and with a two-minute hearing, the city council, with no council member listening at all, and following the advice of Mr. Mark Ridley Thomas, who believes that the right to a hearing does not include the right of the person to be heard, but only to speak, which we disagree with, the city council voted 12 to 0 to uphold the Board of Zoning Appeals. I notice the presiding officer is not listening either, which is why I'm going to get to the point I can ask you to conclude. The point is that after we lost before the city council 12 to 0, I went to the superior court and we won. The superior court ruled that the city council improperly denied the application for the exception. The superior court ordered the city to grant the exception. The city appealed to the court of appeal. Mr. Cotty is here who represents the city and he can also provide some input into this case. The California court of appeal ruled that the trial court correctly ruled that the city council erroneously denied the application for the exception. The court of appeal, however, also said that the superior court went too far in ordering the city to grant the exception, that the city ought to be given a second chance to conduct a hearing to determine whether or not the exception should be granted. I need the you to conclude, please. The California Supreme Court denied review. The case is now before the U.S. Supreme Court. This matter should not be heard by the city council. It should be heard by the zoning administrator because it's gonna take at least a day or two to present the evidence. Okay, this body you. is not the appropriate body to conduct evidentiary hearings because this body doesn't listen to anything. Thank you very the much. Matter should be Thank sent you very to, much. Excuse me, the matter should be sent back to the zoning administrator because the zoning administrator is in Tarzana. The people in the community are closer. Thank you. To, 
Okay, Mr. Zine has uh, made a yes, motion to continue. Uh, we, we do not request it be sent back to the zoning administrator. We have a representative from the city attorney's office who I would call on to address this matter. Mr. City Attorney. Mr. President, a point of order. Uh, this is an important matter. Uh, point, of, point of order, Mr. President. Mr. Rudy Thomas. Point of order, sir. You have to, have to no, you have just hold on for a moment. Just hold on for a moment, please. No, 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 no. Restrain yourself, Mr. Bernson. I know that's an unusual uh, experience for you. This is the point. Sergeant, it's very, very noisy in here. Can't hear, don't know what's going on. And if you would just have those persons who are lined up here, uh, kindly just remove themselves, it would be helpful. It is very, very distracting. Mr. President, we just can't hear. Okay. That's what I said. Now we have three sergeants in here. Thank you, Mr. Rudy Thomas. Uh, two and a half, whatever way you want to <laughs> slice it. <laughs> Mr. Holden. I think we, I'd like, I called on for the city to represent the attorneys to speak on it. If we could hear from him before we hear from anyone else, if that would be appropriate. Thank okay. you. I would only point out for the city council that First of all, my name is John Cotty, and I'm a deputy city attorney who handled this matter before the Superior Court and the Appellate Court. Um, it's important to note that the Superior Court overturned the City Council's decision. It wasn't the decision of the ZA or the Zoning Administrator that was overturned. Therefore, the matter, the Superior Court ordered the City to reconsider its actions in light of its decision, in light of the Superior Court and Appellate Court's decision. Therefore, it's appropriate, since the City Council's findings were challenged, for the City Council to again rehear this matter. Uh, Mr. Diamond's uh, concerns relate to whether or not he will be given a meaningful, uh, meaningful hearing before this body, and I think that this body does that on a daily basis, or at least on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. So I think that the matter should be heard before the City Council because it was the City Council's findings that were challenged, and therefore the City Council should again rehear the matter. Uh, but again, Mr. Diamond's concerns relate to whether or not he will be given an opportunity to present f uh, a full case before this body. Thank you. I would uh, again call for this to be continued to February 27th. Mr. Holden. Mr. President, members, uh, Mr. Diamond, if he's saying he's right and if he should be entitled to address the council and plead his case, and we deny him that, then you're going to have a case, in my opinion, that you're not going to win. Uh, uh, you're not going to win. Uh, Mr. Diamond is an upstanding citizen that I've known for the past 40 years, very active in government from the grassroots level. And for the remaining part of my time, if he were to address the subject matter just on that point and don't get too excited about it, uh, you can use my time for that purpose. Because I would hope that you are not going to engage us in further litigation if at all possible. On Mr. Holden's time. The very fact that I was limited to three minutes today is the best proof that this matter should go back to the zoning administrator who has the time to conduct an evidentiary hearing. Mr. Cotty is wrong when he says that the council was reversed because of findings. The council was reversed because of insufficient evidence that was presented to the zoning administrator. Now, I'm willing to have the council hear this case if you can give us an all-day evidentiary hearing with procedural safeguards. It's obvious that this council was not set up as a trial court tribunal because obviously you have other matters on your agenda, but if you're willing to give us an entire day where we can put on our case, we'll have it before the city council. If you're only going to give me three minutes, we cannot possibly present a case in three minutes, which is why it should go back to the zoning administrator for a public hearing. It's even better for the neighbors. It's easier for them to travel to Tarzana. So I respectfully object to the city council further hearing this matter unless it gives us at least all day to present the case. Otherwise, it should go to the zoning administrator. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, remaining part of my time, you can sit down now, Roger. No, my time is not up. My, the clock is... No, he did not. Mr. Bernson. Mr. Bernson. Mr. Holden. Point of order. order. My clock is running and I'm watching the time right here. That's the point. You, you've been here 28 years. You don't know what the clock is on the computer? Mr. Holden. Mr. Bernson, Mr. You take it. You were supposed to be friends. 
Mr. Holden. Mr. All right, Mr. Holden, Mr. This is Mr. Mr. President, will you control you him? <laughs> all right, all right. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Diamond, thank you for the explanation. Hope that it'll work out with the taxpayers. Don't have to spend any more money. And uh, Mr. The, the continuation of time requested by Mr. Zine, I'm going to vote for it. That'll give us enough time to try to work it out. And Mr. Bernstein, you're out of order. The, uh, Ms. the requirement is Ms. that Mr. notice Mr. be Zine. sent. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. President. The, Ms. The, no, 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 no. It's Ms. Misikowski's turn, oh, followed sorry. by Mr. Bernstein. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I would like, I, I, I have no problem with the recommendation of Mr. Zine, and in fact, I think in terms of keeping with the full public disclosure that we should have done adequate notice, I would like to have the city attorney in preparation for the case when it will be heard on February 27th after notice has gone out to send us a copy of the court's decision because there is a disparity between what the city attorney is telling us and the uh, attorney for the, for the applicant. But I, I will say that in years past, when courts have remanded a case back to the city council for its decision, the city council has the option of choosing whether or not it will hear the case or whether or not it will remand it inasmuch as there were full public hearings at the zoning administrator's uh, level, and I presume at the BZA, and I would just like verification of that, and both made a decision based on evidence that was submitted, and it was the case, at least from the city attorney's telling us, that the city council, in its hearing of the appeal, may not have granted adequate time for information, et cetera, that I would like clarity from the city attorney when the case comes back to us, whether or not it, need, it could be a limited hearing or whether or not it has to be a full hearing and so that we have all of the specifications of the court's decision back to us. But I clearly think that it is the capability of this body to hold those hearings, to review the case, to have the matter before it. And, uh, and, and as I think, I, I, it was very interesting. Mr. Diamond did make a point that I think was valid. He said it's not good enough to just let somebody speak. The requirement, I think, that the court validated that we have to listen. And that is probably a lesson the council should hear from more often than this case. But I think that when that occurs, I would like to have the, uh, the city attorney specify those, uh, those details to us. And with that, I have no problem with the uh, recommendation of Mr. Zine to give it a more full, adequate, thorough notice for a hearing so we can hear from all sides as the matter is brought back to us for that decision as remanded by the court. Mr. City Attorney. I can provide Ms. Misikowski and, the, and every other member with a copy of the Court of Appeal and the Superior Court's decision. And I will be re prepared to brief that when we next meet on February 27th. And the confirmation of uh, hearings held at the uh, ZA and at the Commission as requested by Ms. Misikowski. I'm sorry, I could not hear you. She made a specific request on confirmation of hearings held prior to this matter reaching the Council. I can do that as well, Your Honor. Okay. Mr. Bernson. Mr. President. I have a couple of questions. Uh, the, uh, Mr. Diamond states that this was the, what the application was for an exemption of the planning code. What was the uh, land use designation in the area where this was asked for? I believe it was zoned commercial, and it was not appropriate for an adult entertainment establishment. I could be mistaken. I can get According that According to our codes, According why was it not appropriate? It was too close to a residential neighborhood. It was within the 500 feet zone required by 1270C of okay. the Los Angeles Municipal Code. Yeah, which I incidentally wrote. So the point is, I'm, I'm asking, uh, basically any ex exception would be either, exceptions are done two ways in this city. They're done by variance or by conditional use permit or for a change of zoning or whatever the case may be. But that's assuming that you don't change the code. So the, the, the statement that it's not a, a variance, it is a, it is a, a variance or a difference from what our zoning codes call for. And I cannot understand why the judge has, in this particular case, ruled against the city because we have the right to regulate. In fact, when the ordinance was, was passed, we had to provide the courts because it was challenged and upheld. Not only in this city, but it was upheld in other cities in the United States by the Supreme Court. Uh, the fact is that we had to supply a map of locations that were appropriate within the city where adult entertainment businesses could locate so that they could not say that we were not permitting adult businesses in the city. There is an appropriate place for them, and this was not obviously an appropriate place. Uh, so I don't know what the court findings was, whether the findings were not appropriate or what was not appropriate, but certainly it was in accordance 
uh, with the conditions that are provided under our city codes, under our zoning requirements. And even though this uh, may have had a, uh, the judge has ordered us to take another look at it, there's no way that I am ever going to support overruling what has been done. We may take another look at it, but this is something that has to be appealed to higher courts, and there's just no other way about it. Now, certainly Mr. Diamond, at the appropriate time, will be given an opportunity to make his case, whether it's before the council or before the uh, Plum Committee, which I don't think Mr. Reyes wants it at this stage of the game, but he might. Uh, the point is that uh, I, I do feel that uh, this is something that the judge was definitely in error on, because our codes, which have been upheld by the high courts, have been what this judge has virtually said is the Supreme Court of the United States is wrong. Okay? Well, we know that they may be wrong, but not on, not on his say-so. So uh, I would suggest that we continue this to the date that Mr. Zion has asked for, and we take another look at it, give Mr. Diamond an opportunity to state his case, and then we go back to the courts. Mr. Zion. I would ask that we move the previous. Thank you. Okay. Uh, seeing nobody else wishing to be heard on this item, uh, Madam Clerk, please open the roll on the motion to continue. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. Okay, that matter is continued. Next item, please. Um, Mr. President, members of the council, a message from Mr. Uh, Reyes to Mr. Holden and Mr. Burnson. Let freedom ring. <laughs> Madam Clerk. Next items, Mr. President, items for which public hearings have been held, items 5 through 14. Um, item number 9 is uh, an item that no action is required that has already been acted on. And item number 10, there are two reports on the file and a motion is required. Items 4 through, excuse me, 5 through 14. Now before us, public hearing has been held on these items. Any specials? Mr. Holden calls item 7 special. Ms. Galantra calls item 10 special. Any other specials? Any other specials? Items 5 through 14. Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the roll on the balance of the items. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. Items 5 and 6 forthwith, please. Next item. Next items, Mr. President. Items for which public hearings have not been held. Items 15 through 31. I have cards on item number 19. Let's call that special. Uh, and no request from members of the public to speak on the balance of the items. We shall deem the public hearing open and closed on those. Members, any specials? Mr. Garcetti calls 29 special. Any other specials? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the roll on the balance of the items. This is items 15 through 31? Yes, Mr. President, uh, with the exception of 19 and 29. Okay, the roll is open. Please close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. Those items are approved. Next items on the continuation agenda, excuse me, on the supplemental agenda, items for which public hearing, item for which public hearing has been held, item 32, that's an ITGS report submitted without recommendation. A motion is required. Okay, item number 32 now before us. Uh, motion is required from the floor. Is there a motion on item 32? Seeing none, let's call that special. Mr. Garcetti, did you wish to be heard? I just had a, a question on 32. Are we, is it being considered yet? We're going to call it special. Okay. We'll come back to it. Next item, please. Next items, items 33 through 35, items for which public hearings have not been held. Uh, I believe there's a, an amending motion on item number 34. Yeah, let's call 34 special. Items 33 oh. and 35, no request from members of the public to be heard on these items. Members wishing to call either 33 or 35 special. Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the roll on those two items. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. Those are approved. Mr. Pacheco. Mr. President, uh, we're simply going to request that we continue item 32 to Friday, but I'm not sure which of my colleagues called it special. So if no well, one's I, called it, 
Don't Item 32 is before us without a recommendation. A motion was needed from the floor. Oh, I called it just, special. It, okay, so it was um, not a call from the floor. No. So let us just request that we continue to Friday. We're working out some details on okay, that matter. Okay, Mr. Garcetti had a question on the item. Is that okay with you, Mr. Garcetti? Without to Friday. Without objection, item 32 is continued to January 18th. Next item, please. Going back to the items that have been called special, excuse me, uh, closed session is on the desk. Do you want to hold that, item 36? Let's hold item 36. Uh, item number seven is called special by council member Holden. Mr. Holden, item number seven. Uh, Mr. President, members on this uh, victim assistance program, uh, maybe someone can come up and explain that to us and how the money is being apportioned per neighborhood and why. And is the program citywide? And if not, why not? Ooh! Deaton, what are you doing? I'm a little short. <laughs> so, good morning. Uh, my name is Kathy Kalabong. I'm the assistant administrator for the City Attorney Victim Assistance Program. And I'm sorry, but I. Didn't oh, you didn't get, get the questions? Is this a citywide program? Yes. It yes is. or no? Uh, is the money being apportioned equally per, throughout the city, East Council District? Yes or no? Yes. First come, first serve? Yes or no? Is it helping uh, one group of people rather than another? Yes or no? Will you tell me about that? Yes, the Victim Assistance Program through the City Attorney's Office has, um, helps all crime victims um, of all types of crime. Crime victims? Yes. All types of crimes. Well, give me an example of the kind of crimes you're talking about. For the past 22 years on our basic grant, we've helped victims of domestic violence, hate crimes, survivors of homicide victims, child and elder abuse, robbery and assault, and in our special emphasis grant, which is item number seven, we've been in existence since 1993. It's a federally funded program which targets underserved minority victims in various counties through the, throughout the state of California. And in Los Angeles, we've targeted the Korean American community um, who were victims. What was that again? Of Say that again, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yes, for the special emphasis grant, we uh, provide assistance to the uh, victims of, of robbery and assault, um, hate crimes, elder abuse, drunk driving in the Korean American community of Los Angeles. Korean American community. Correct. Well, why would you specify Korean community, American community as opposed to specifying other communities? It's a federal uh, grant funded Is it federal program. saying, do they say Korean American community? Basically, or do we say that? Uh, the city, the city did when we submitted. Okay, and why grant. not the, the Armenian American community? At the time that we applied for the grant, the VOCA guidelines or the Federal uh, Victims of Crime Act um, indicated through the grant proposal that it must be a target minority underserved group in your county or your city that needs assistance. Underserved. In what way was, and I represent Korean community, community that's why I'm what way is it being underserved in order to qualify as a minority underserved community? Well, let me go ahead and answer that if I could. Yeah, I want you to do that. Uh, my name is Alex Vargas. I head up the Victims of Crime Program. When I first started with the Victims of Crime Program, we had a staff member who happened to speak Korean, and that staff member pointed out the discrepancies in that serving of that community. Although we would be able to receive the police reports, we wouldn't be able to communicate with them. So that was a problem that was brought to our attention. And at the same time, uh, special emphasis grants were being brought forth by the state. So with that in mind, we applied for the grant and we received it. But basically it was just a community that was localized and had a need. So what you really needed was someone who could speak Korean, not what they would get special benefits as opposed to other uh, parts no. of the city. The benefits are consistent with our basic grant. The benefits are consistent. That's what I need to hear. Very consistent straight across the board. Everything that is provided to the Korean community is being provided via the basic grant to all sections of the city of Los Angeles. We do not separate the entitlements. It's based on uh, the state of California's requirements for victims of violence. Well, you, don't, you don't have much money in this program. What's the largest amount of money that you're given 
granted to an individual who is a victim of a crime? The maximum we could give to each individual victim is $70,000, $70, and that will be for loss of support, lost wages. Uh, it could include funeral and burial on a homicide case. Uh, it would include medical, uh, psychological counseling. And, how, much, uh, how much money is in this program? Pardon me? How much money is in the program? $110,000. Is that so? You give away seventy thousand. You only got one hundred ten thousand. No, that seventy thousand is what the victims are entitled to, based on each individual act of violence. In terms of how much money we we brought into the city of Los Angeles, uh, do you have that that information? We bring in uh, within the basic grant as well as the special emphasis between seven and nine million dollars okay. yearly. All that's right. what we bring in. That's tax-free money as well. Okay, fine. Because, uh, Mr. President, members, I think this is important to know that there are a lot of victims almost every day, uh, murders, homicides in the city of Los Angeles. And many people who are victims are not aware that this program exists even today, let alone 20 plus years ago. So whereas you have identified one community as underserved, then I would say that the, all the entire rest of the city is underserved, given the fact they're not aware of this program. Absolutely. This is not a program that is, is very popular until the need is there. Then well, it's the need it should be popular on a daily basis because the need is there on a daily basis because well, there's so many victims. Absolutely. The, the responsibility goes on the Los Angeles Police Department, and they take care of that by the preliminary investigation cover sheet that identifies the local victim centers. Okay. And at that point, th they either make contact with us or since we have LAPD staff, right. we will All make right. contact enough, with enough. them. There's a state program as well. There's Correct. a state program for victim, up to ten thousand dollars per per case. I think no, it used to be. It used to be uh, many years ago. Now it's seventy thousand. Seventy thousand. Well, I want the public out there is watching this on TV, and this kind of information I want to disseminate to my constituents at least. In those cases where you believe, or in fact, you become a victim of a violent crime, the ones that have been specified, then you are to contact the city attorney's office the city attorney, city of Los Angeles, for grants up to $70,000 if you lose the breadwinner. It's, Is that correct? It's reimbursement. It's not a grant. It's a direct reimbursement for out-of-pocket losses. Well, how many people don't have $70,000? You didn't say that before. Well, we, we, that money, we will, we will intercede on their behalf with the creditors, funeral homes, uh, with their employer, whatever it may be, we will intercede. We will be their advocate for all their incurred costs. We will take care of that. Incurred costs, cost only. Yes, okay. and to include any loss of uh, support, uh, lost wages, those types of things. We loss take care of. of wages. That's uh, that's we, that's what we're talking about. That's exactly. And that could be up to seventy thousand dollars for a year or two for a year of, of lost wages or two years of lost wages, whichever the case may be. Seventy thousand dollars would be the maximum that they would be able to receive, and it is tax-free money. All right. So that's important for the public to know. Absolutely. And I'm sure you'll be getting some phone calls. What is your name and telephone number? Uh, my name is Alex Vargas. I'm the executive director for the. Alex Vargas. Correct. And your executive director? Yes. And the phone number is 213-485-6976. Uh, I think the public need to know that. Repeat I, your telephone number. Area code 213-485-6976. Thank you very much for Thank your you. information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holden. Anybody else wishing to be heard on this item? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the roll on item number seven. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. That is approved. Let's send that forthwith. Next item, please. Item number 10, call special by Council Member Galanter. Ms. Galanter. Mr. President, I just want to move the minority report. This is an item we've discussed previously in the Council, as you know, since we last uh, discussed this proposed public relations contract at the airport. The uh, Board of Airport Commissioners has um, taken an alternative course of action, but in order to complete the work on this file, uh, the council does have to dispose of it, and the minority report, which would disapprove the uh, uh, the contract, will settle the issue. So I move the minority report. Okay, Mr. Weiss. Thank you. I want to rise in support of Ms. Galander's motion and praise her for bringing this to our attention. Uh, I guess it was the week before we broke for recess in December. Um, she she uh, she's focused on this issue for a number of months and. She deserves a lot of credit for that. Um, 
This is a good public policy result, so congratulations to you, Ms. Galaner. You did a very good thing for the City of Los Angeles. Thank you, Mr. Weiss. Anybody else wishing to be heard on item number 10? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. Minority report is adopted. Next item, please. Uh, Mr. President, there's been a request from the city attorney to continue the closed session item to tomorrow. That's January 16th. Okay. Members request to continue item 36 without objection. That item is continued. Next, next item, please. Next item, Mr. President, item number 19 calls special in as much as there are cards from the public. Public hearing has not been held. Uh, we do have three members of the public wishing to be heard. The council calls forward for item number 19, Maria Loya, to be followed by Tom Walsh and is it Chawi Sukajitani? Is Ms. Loya still with us? Go ahead. Hello. Um, since 9-11, thousands of workers have been impacted at LAX. We have worked with LAWA to attempt to address and alleviate the situation. Currently, we are working with LAWA to prepare and assist pre-board screeners in the transition so they can become federalized screeners. We are still waiting to see and also, we are still waiting to see if there will be any long-term plan put in place to assist employers during this time of crisis in order to ease the layoffs or uh, cut in hours. The Airport Commission also adopted the responsible contractor on December uh, 18th. However, we have been informed by representatives at LAWA that the rules and regulations won't be done for another six months. And uh, I'm sorry, for another 60 days. Um, however, in the meantime, employers continue to take advantage and abuse their workers. Many employers are firing their workers in retaliation for, mere, for workers merely standing up for themselves. Also, employers are not giving their workers their breaks. They are working 10 to 12 hours, and they are not giving their breaks. And when they do ask their breaks, they, they have been fired. Also, employers are refusing to pay overtime. These are some of the situations that continue, and until the, respons the rules and regulations for uh, responsible contractors are completed, responsible contractor cannot come into effect. Other things that, that we've been working with LAWA um, are, again, to try to improve the situation, and, uh, and we appreciate their assistance in this matter. Lastly, um, I want to mention that the City of Los Angeles, along with uh, LAWA, made a commitment to improve the jobs at LAX um, and making them decent and good paying jobs. However, since the passage of the living wage, um, there, have, there still remains more than 300 jobs that are non-living wage at LAX. And we would like to work with you and also work with LAWA to try to improve the jobs at LAX. And at the same time, uh, try to bring, bring up uh, the standard of living uh, at these jobs for these workers, especially during this time of crisis. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tom Walsh to be followed by Ms. Sukhja Tanawi. Uh, yes, good morning. Tom Walsh, president of Hotel Employees, Restaurant Employees Union, representing the concession employees at LAX. Um, our members are still suffering. Although we have not seen any new layoffs since December, uh, there have uh, been very few of our members recalled. Um, we do appreciate everything that uh, the council and the airport commission have done uh, to assist our members and other workers during these very difficult times. Um, as you've just heard, we still do have, though, one uh, major concern, uh, which is that the responsible contractor ordinance, which was um, adopted by the airport commission, the regulations have, not, have yet to be implemented. And at the same time, some of the employers, um, actually one in particular, Jetway Express, um, has uh, numerous violations of labor law and uh, other laws, and they are one of the companies that are seeking rent relief. 
Uh, so we urge uh, you to direct the airport to adopt these regulations as soon as possible. Thank you. Our final speaker. Good morning. My name is Shelby Sukachetani. I represent my co-workers at Jetway Express in LAX Airport. Four months ago, Jetway Express management fired me for supporting the unions and living wages. The excuse they used was that after working on my feet for nearly five hours, I sat out for 10 minutes breaks. When Jetway fried me, they broke the law, but Jetway breaks the law and violates the lives for my co-workers every day. They pay below the living wage, they refuse to pay it over time. They cheat us on our holidays, sick days, and vacation times. They force us to work long hours without breaks. They punish us when we speak up. This is not fair. This company is taking advantage of us. They do not appreciate the hard works we do. I'm fighting to get my job back and all of our fighting for the fair union contract. What Jetways offer us is not fair. Now, Jetways want to take advantage of the city. They once lately leave from the city at the same time. They steal our work and put me out on the street. I and my co-workers will keep on fighting for our lives. And we need the responsible contract a lot now. We cannot wait. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. This concludes public comment and item number 19. Members wishing to be heard, Mr. Pacheco. Mr. President and colleagues, I believe when uh, we last were discussing the airport, we had asked uh, the commission to come back or the administration to come back and give us an update on what efforts and what options they're exploring. So I would like to hear that. Also, uh, I would like to ask a very simple question. Um, most of the vendors at the airport, I understand from their, their viewpoint, are concerned about uh, losing their spot and losing their location due to the downturn in the economy. Most of the workers are very concerned that as we keep asking for rent, uh, that we're basically putting them out on the streets. Uh, have we explored uh, giving our vendors uh, extensions on their contracts without going out to bid and therefore creating a longer lifespan to recuperate any rent uh, owed because one of the options I had put out last time was to give them a one-year grace period on rent and then have a, a phased-in payback. Now that will only work or the best way of assuring that that works is if we gave contract extensions to our vendors uh, so that they have the time and the lifespan to pay back any monies owed. And I just want to know if that was an option considered, because I think that could be uh, something that everyone can win. The workers uh, stay at the place. The vendors uh, have a longer lifespan to pay us back. I know the initial hit will be pretty hard in terms of uh, the airport, but in the long run, I think it'll, it'll even out. So can I hear from the staff in terms of what options were explored and where we are in assisting uh, our vendors and, more importantly, uh, the workers. Good morning, council members. Uh, my name is Paul Green. I'm the chief operating officer of the Los Angeles World Airports. Joining me this morning, I have the director of administration uh, on our staff, which is Bill Bruce on my left and the Deputy Executive Director of Properties and Concessions, uh, Rick Janice, on my right. What I would like to do is give you a brief overview of what we've been doing in this arena, and then we will turn specifically to the issues that have been raised and, and be happy to respond to those. Shortly after the, the aftermath of the tragedy of September 11th, 
at Lydia Kennard's direction, the executive director of the airport, we formed an economic impact task force. Uh, the task force is chaired by me. It's comprised of members of my staff, members of labor, members of the concession, uh, the partners that we have at the airport, our concession group, uh, and the airlines, as well as CDD. Lillian Kawasaki was gracious enough to agree to serve in that capacity. Uh, we basically approach this problem uh, from uh, in a two-pronged approach, really. Number one is to deal with the employee issues, to, to bring the, uh, the benefits that they're all entitled to by virtue of the layoff, to mitigate the hardships uh, working through CDD, the rapid response, as well as to pull together any employers out in the airport community who were in need of workers and match that with people who were affected by the layoff. And, I, and we've had some successes in that regard, and I'll turn to Bill in a moment, let him uh, take you through those. On the other side, we dealt with uh, the business issue, and that was to work with the concession partners that we have to try to uh, give them access to small business loans where that might be appropriate. We've had some, some developments in that regard to try to figure out ways that we do business. Are there procedural issues, security issues at the airport that we can improve that's impacting their business? Uh, we're willing to look, for example, at moving uh, concessions on this side of security via kiosk and those kinds of concepts to help them generate revenue. And then lastly, uh, what we were trying to do is, is of course, implement the concession relief uh, program that the Commission approved that covered the, uh, the last three months of, of last year. So let me stop here and let me turn quickly to Bill and talk about the employee side. Then we'll turn to Rick and talk about the concession side and then we'll make sure we address any of the issues that have been raised. Bill. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Mr. President, members, Bill Bruce, Director of Administration, Los Angeles World Airports. Uh, in response to the Council's request for information regarding the impact of the September 11th terrorist attacks on employment, we have, um, I'd, like to, I'd like to approach this and, and, and give you some information in two areas. First, the employment impact indicators. Um, I'd, I'd like to say that um, LAWA staff uses information that has been developed by other governmental in organizations, other uh, private and nonprofit sector sources to assess employment trends at the airport. We have also followed up with our staff contacting airport-related employers to supplement this information. Uh, some of the highlights that um, uh, I'd like to present to you this morning to give you an idea of the magnitude of um, what has happened out there. Under the Federal Worker Adjustment and Retraining Notification Act, or the WARN notices, which are required to be filed with the City of Los Angeles and the State of California by employers over a hundred, uh, employing over a hundred individuals, um, those companies that are specifically represented at LAX show that 2,669 employees received layoff notices. Of those, approximately 2,100 have been from major airline carriers, including United, American, Continental, Northwest, and TWA. To date, our staff has confirmed that uh, 300 of those, four, those laid off uh, employees have been rehired and called back to work by American Airlines. The County Federation of Labor also reports that some 6,000 travel and tourism employees have been laid, laid off or financially impacted um, in the Los Angeles area since September the 11th. Uh, as Mr. Walsh uh, mentioned earlier, um, he is the representative from the Hotel Employee and Restaurant uh, Union Local 814, as he is a member of our Economic Impact Task Force, he has reported that 800 of his members um, have suffered layoff. Um, those include employers such as HMS Host, Sky Chef, CA1, and WH Smith um, at the airport. To date, our staff has confirmed that 75 employees uh, laid off by HMS hosts have been recalled to work. Our security badge office is responsible for uh, badging every worker that works at LAX. 
And we have shown that between um, uh, September and January 9th, there has been a decrease in active badges of approximately 3,600, which then gives you the range of magnitude of uh, employees that have been affected out at LAX. So what has LAWA been doing to assist the displaced workers? Well, through our Small Business and Job Opportunity Division, uh, we have done um, a number of things, including on October 3rd and October 10th, we, we had two half-day sessions for employers at LAX to provide them information with regard to unemployment insurance, job training, retraining opportunities that were available through uh, a number of our partnering resources. We also held three orientation sessions for the uh, Displaced Workers Rapid Response Group that um, is, is uh, on, uh, as part of uh, CDD's Rapid Response staff. Uh, those were held in our, in our offices and were primarily oriented for the airline. CDD's Rapid Response unit has um, had at least 25 additional rapid response meetings with LAX employers uh, over the last few months. On October, excuse me, on November 7th, we held the We Care Job Fair. Uh, this was attended by 1,500 laid off uh, air, air, airlines and airport related employers, um, um, employees, and we have uh, had done some follow-up, and we see that at least 37 confirmed jobs have resulted from that job fair. Uh, LAWA has participated in that, in that 13 of those uh, people hired were for our new security aid program to help us with uh, traffic control in the central terminal area. On January 10th, the um, Century Housing Corporation, which uh, has an MOU with LAWA, uh, held a, an orientation session for a new pre-apprenticeship training program um, where we are preparing workers for entry into the construction trades. Information was sent to 1,500 laid off airport employees and um, about 200 showed up for the orientation. This is a program that is funded by the State Employment Training Panel. On Friday, we are partnering with um, the Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy, or LANE, to do a resume workshop for existing pre-board screeners to help them prepare them for the new federal screener positions. Uh, with this will be followed on next Tuesday uh, by an information and application workshop regarding these new federal positions that's being sponsored by Representative Jane Harmon and conducted through one of our partners, the Los Angeles County Workforce Investment Board. And finally, on February the 7th, we're going to hold a second job fair uh, at the Proud Bird. It will be from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. that day, and we anticipate the um, assistance of over 100 employers to join us in, um, in looking at candidate, potential candidates for jobs that they have. Before uh, actually you continue, uh, I wanted to acknowledge Mr. Bernson for a brief introduction. Members of the council, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce, we have some visitors here today from Cal State University Northridge. Uh, there's a group of 24 adults who are here with uh, Gwen Esch who is the Master of Business Administration at Cal State. These students are all originally from Dalian, China, and currently at, uh, at uh, CSUN, Cal State Northridge. So please stand to be recognized. And we want to welcome you to Los Angeles. And uh, I might add that we're very happy to have Cal State Northridge and them in the 12th District. Thank you. Thank you very much. Enjoy your visit. Mr. Labanj. Yeah, uh, follow Mr. Burton. That's great to have all our friends from China Special greetings to Quanzhou, China, one of our sister cities on your return trip. Say hello to all our friends in Quanzhou, China, sister city of Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burton. Thank you, Mr. LaBanche. 
Okay, continue with the... Uh, council President Padilla, response. member of the uh, City Council. On December 4th of last year, the Board of Airport Commissioners approved a $9.5 million rent reduction and capital investment deferral program for the concessioners at LAX in Ontario that were affected by the terrorist attacks of September 11th. There were four major components to that program. For the period of September 11th through the 14th, concessioners received a rent credit equal to the four days of their minimum annual guarantee. For the months October, November, and December, the concessionaire's rent was reduced from the minimum annual guarantee to the contractual percentage of gross sales set forth in their agreements, excluding the year-over-year uh, -year decline in sales experience due to the general economic decline. All contractually required capital investments were deferred for one year, and assistance from LAWA to MBE and DBE and small business concessionaires uh, was given in terms of uh, assistance in getting government and business loans. In order to qualify for inclusion in the program, concessionaires were required to comply with city ordinances, to increase staffing to the August 2001 level when passenger employments returned to the 2001 level, pass along rent relief to sub-concessionaires on a pro rata basis, bring all accounts current, including faithful performance guarantees, demonstrate that no business interruption insurance was available that would be redundant with the program, and demonstrate that their business remained open unless constrained by security or otherwise previously approved. To date, 15 concessionaires out of a total of 44 have elected to participate in the program. With the help of the City Council, agreement amendments have been prepared for those concessionaires and are scheduled to be sent down towards the end of the month for CAO review, Board of Airport Commissional approval, and City Council approval. Uh, in addition, as Bill mentioned earlier, um, staff has assisted concessionaires with government funding assistance. It is estimated that, it, that approximately 16 funding requests are being processed to date. In the Economic Impact Task Force that Mr. Green mentioned earlier, the concessionaires that participated in that task force urged staff to promote uh, the airport to the community and to increase passenger services to increase the actual employments. Nothing will help the concessionaires better uh, business more than to increase the, increase the employments at the airport. In response, staff engaged a firm to analyze the passenger perception of the airport, uh, which will be used in future promotional efforts that are being formulated, and staff is in the process of implementing a food and beverage slash news concession on wheels program to service passengers that are now waiting in some of the longer security screening lines and for the meters and greeters that now congregate in the um, inbound baggage claim areas. Thank you. That uh, concludes the overview. If, if I might, there's one issue that uh, uh, it was the uh, responsible contractor issue that was raised, and I don't know where six months came from, but staff advises me that we'll have that done in, what, 30, about 30 days? Mr. Reyes. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, responsible, con uh, responsible contract, the six months issue that was raised earlier that would take us to get procedures done, staff advises me that that's like 30 days. I'm not sure where six months came from. So, so that appears to be imminent. Okay. Mr. Reyes. I just want to make sure that we answered the questions raised by our colleague before he had to leave, but the concern he shares, I share them as well in terms of what we're doing with uh, the employees, so he had a very specific question about the extending of the uh, extension of contracts with tenants and giving people a chance so that we could at least sustain their jobs with these extensions and other strategies. So if you can speak to that, we'd appreciate that if you can hold my time. In formulating the concession relief program, we looked at a number of options, including extending uh, some of the concession contracts. Uh, what the Board of Airport Commissions has adopted are the four components of the program as previously set forth. Um, no work is being done on extensions at this time. Why not? Um, the immediate program addressed really the first four months initial relief to the concessionaires and the Board of Airport Commissioners has really not gone farther than that. We keep them apprised of what the business activity levels are um, and pass that along to them. It's clear to me that the folks that have spoke during public hearing are desperate. They want their jobs back. 
there is illusion that they are being punished because they're advocating for their livelihood. The only means by which they can have any voice is to present that case here. And this is a chance where we can see you personally, hear you, mm -hmm. and understand what you're doing. So what are we doing to support that? Are we following through with these complaints and are we dealing with these very human issues? On top of the fact that why don't we extend that contract so we can deal with this uh, crisis? Well, the, with, with respect to the living wage issue, the overwhelming majority of contracts we do have in place do contain and comply with living wage. Uh, we are getting those in place as fast as contracts come up, and we have an opportunity to get living wage in place. Uh, with respect to the individual complaints that, uh, that, are, that are being voiced, uh, some of these are new to me. To the degree that, that, they become, that we become aware of those, we can uh, certainly apprise the, uh, the tenants of those. There are processes in place in the labor relations arena to redress those grievances. And I, so, I'm, so, I'm sure that that is being So done. do we have to keep calling you back to the council floor to tell us what's happening? Or is there going to be another way of dealing with this? Well, the, the, with the issue of, of the... Can you hold my time, please? With the issue, with the issue of the contracts, uh, basically, we certainly are aware of the concessions concerns, uh, as is the commission. Uh, and we certainly are, are aware of your concerns. Uh, we will be communicating that to the commission on an ongoing basis. Uh, but as of right now, the Commission has a, a concession relief program in place that's defined as the 90-day program that was enumerated by Mr. Janice. So, uh, colleagues, I believe that we need a stronger mechanism where we can hold accountability tighter. The people that are being heard are the people that live in our districts. The people that are being heard are the people that don't have jobs that live in our districts. These are the people that are fulfilling those jobs, and they're the ones that are heard the least. So I strongly recommend, I'm not sure how to do this, but let's get a mechanism where we can tie in a tighter rein, if you will, so that we know the accountability, accountability is there, there's performance there, and they don't get lost in the quagmire of all this stuff that we keep hearing. Quite, quite frankly, it doesn't translate into jobs. I mean, how does it translate into jobs or permanence of security of some level? I know life doesn't have guarantees in anything. But the fact is, if we have discretion, we have the ability to perform, why don't we do that? And then why don't we get that extension to six months? What does it take for us to get those six months? That's, that's a policy issue that the commission will make. Okay, okay thank you. I defer to my colleague, uh, Councilman McGillan. Mr. Garcetti. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'd like to echo a lot of what Councilmember Reyes said and, and also send a very strong message to the commission that this elected body here does not want to play this game in terms of when we say something very strongly, especially that I think there are a lot of us that were very supportive of, of rent breaks for the concessionaires, but because we have people that we represent that actually work there too, that was supposed to be tied to responsible contracting, and we had people who came and testified from our offices at the commission, and we had that assurance from you. Um, I can understand that you're pulled between these two bodies, but I think um, at the end of the day, we have the authority and can assert that authority if we need to, but we don't want to have that sort of relationship with the commission either. Um, the, the message that we get very clearly here today, and I'd like to thank HERE for being here as well as um, representatives from the workers, is that this requires sort of the sort of vigilance that this council is engaged on and will be there for. Um, there are many of us that are very sympathetic to the economic situation, and we know, and I think that you agree with us, that we can get a win-win situation out of this, where there are rent breaks. I think what Councilmember Pacheco is, uh, suggests is an intriguing idea and something that may merit further study as well, but some sort of breaks, but that always comes with responsibility, and that's what we ask of business and economic development in this city, is that people ask for a helping hand from the city and that we extend that at the same time we ask them to extend a hand to their workers and have that sort of fair treatment. So um, can we get a commitment from you today in terms of making sure that that language again will be in there and will be in there very soon, if not, you know, this week and tied to the rent breaks for the responsible contracting? The, the, the language, that, well, that, the, the concession relief program is a policy issue that is adopted and approved by the Airport Commission. Staff, I can say that, that staff, nor the, I, I think I can speak for the Commission, nobody's oblivious to the hardship that's been created. The fastest way they were going to get back to business as usual is get traffic back at the airport. We still have financial challenges at the airport to the tune of 12 to $13 million a month. 
uh, until such time as traffic improves, we're, we're going to be digging that hole deeper and deeper. So, so we have our challenges. We understand the problems that are, that are created for employees and the businesses out there. Uh, but there's a fine line about how much, how much can you do and not do. And there's, there's certainly a compelling argument to do something. Uh, and we have ongoing dialogue with the Commission, but that is a policy decision that the Airport Commission is going to have to make. That is not a decision that staff can make unilaterally. And, and I think that you have a council that wants to help the, the airport return to that. I think there are people who want to make sure that when we reconfigure an airport that that's done in a way that concessionaires can, are able to, to have that sort of foot traffic that we think about that long term and also medium term. Um, I would just say in closing though to, to those concessionaires that are there and to the commission, being a responsible employer does not cost anything. It's about what sort of attitude you have towards workers. Mr. LeBond, did you wish to be heard on this item? No. Ms. Galantra. Um, thank you. I, I first of all want to thank you for coming, and I know that uh, you're often in a difficult position because there are real financial challenges out there. But I, I, Mr. Reyes, part of the answer to your concern is that the staff can't really get out ahead of the commission, and so I think that there are many wonderful people on the staff at the at uh, LAWA, and they understand this problem much the way we do. But unless the commission is willing to let them do this stuff, to adopt the policies, their hands are tied. So part of our job, and part of the reason I was shaking my head, yes, we do have to ask them to keep coming back, is that we, between us, the, well, among all of us, the workers, the displaced workers, the business owners who are hurting, the staff people who, who uh, have a pretty clear understanding, and the council have got to find a way to constantly remind the commission where the commission ought to position itself. But they can't get ahead of the, you know, they can't come in with a program that the commission won't adopt. They've got to get it through the commission before it gets here. So we may have to help them, uh, help the commission understand where the priorities are here. Um, it would, I, I guess I wanted to raise a couple of things. Um, I love the idea of moving some of the food service out to where the customers are, because I can tell you, as I'm sure you know, it's very boring standing on those lines, and people do get hungry, and they would be happy to buy things if they could get to it. I think it's important, though, as you do that, to make sure that the people who are going to be providing that service are the ones who are going to, first of all, are going to be responsible contractors under our definition and that that's going to be a source of jobs for the people who've been laid off, so that we're not adding a whole new bunch of companies and leaving the other guys still holding the bag. Um, the other thing I wanted to raise, just so, and you may have said this while I was talking to some other people, is uh, as a condition of the rent relief and the other, as you're renegotiating with the contracts, are you including as a matter of routine that if you want relief from the airport that you you sign on as a responsible contractor with the obligations that are inherent in that? Yes. Yes. Okay. So anybody who's going to get relief, any business that's coming in and saying, give us a piece of the relief, is going to agree to all the provisions of this responsible contractor thing. Right. Or they don't get the relief. Right. Including okay. the living wage, worker retention, and all other city ordinances. All the stuff. Okay. Right. Now, but as I recall, the responsible contractor ordinance was adopted subsequent to some of these contracts that you're now renegotiating. So some of them don't have that provision in it. You're putting everything in now, right? We, we do have an opportunity since it's a quid pro quo arrangement. Exactly. exactly. Just what I had right. in mind. Right. I uh, just want to make sure it's happening. So, okay, so that one is on. So to does that help? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Glenn. To, to answer your other question about the, the uh, food and beverage on wheels program, we have gone to the concessionaires, the food and beverage concessionaires at each terminal, and we're working with them on providing the service, you know, in that terminal for the people standing in line and down in the inbound baggage claim area as a way to try to get a lot of these jobs back. I think it's a great idea. Thank you. Ms. Hahn. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I rise today to, to uh, just reiterate uh, my commitment, and I think it's this council's commitment, to the workers uh, at LAX, uh, as well as, uh, as the, the vendors and the contractors. And I, I, for one, was very troubled by the testimony this morning from the workers who uh, were claiming they've been punished 
Uh, they have not been given uh, breaks. They've stood for five hours and, and then not given their fair share of breaks. So I am extremely troubled by what I've heard today. It sounds like these were some complaints that you haven't heard uh, until today as well. And I'd like to know um, how we're going to investigate what we heard today, uh, what we're going to do in response to that. But that's extremely troubling. And I, I just want to reiterate again my commitment since September 11th was um, always to tie together any help or relief that we gave to our contractors and our vendors directly to the workers. Uh, some of those who we gave rent relief for, and I'm assuming uh, since Christmas they have they've done a little bit better. They've gone a little bit more on their feet, and has that been tied directly to rehiring uh, at least one, maybe two, maybe three employees? I didn't get that from the report. It still also sounds like we have a lot many more workers who have been permanently laid off that have not uh, gotten rehired. Uh, it sounds like we've got good programs out there. We've made offers and we've got job fairs. There's retraining available. But I'm not hearing, you know, good solid numbers of those who have been uh, rehired. And I, you know, I'm, I'm troubled by reports I'm reading in the paper about the airline sort of using September 11th and, and yet uh, uh, kind of using that as an excuse for continuing to lay off employees. So I'm, I'm troubled by some of these recent reports, uh, but I want to say that I'm committed, as I think this council is, to making sure that we first and foremost are remembering our, our workers who have been laid off. But it sounds like we've got trouble, troubles with workers who are still, to, who are still have jobs but are not being treated uh, very fairly. I also want to support the, the efforts of uh, the, the meals on, not meals on wheels, but coffee on wheels. Uh, I think that is a good idea. I support that. One of the things I'm thinking of, clearly it's this commission, the, the, uh, harbor, uh, the airport commission, that in my opinion is uh, uh, maybe not going far enough. Uh, I think it would be uh, appropriate that we write a letter uh, to, the, to the, or have the commission come here, but I'd like to put it in, uh, in writing. I think we ought to write uh, Ted Stein and all the commissioners a letter basically outline everything we've talked about today and urging him to, uh, to lead his commissioners in the right direction. I'd like to see it in writing. Uh, I would like to know if anyone here has been writing down some of the comments we've, we've been making. That would be my motion that we actually send a letter on behalf of the city council to the commission president and commissioners as soon as possible. Mr. Reyes. It's just one comment. I would do the letter and also bring them down here as well. Uh, but I'd also like to just close the question so that we can move on with our agenda. Okay. You are the final speaker on this item. So I'd like to respond to uh, Councilwoman Hahn's question about the language uh, protecting the workers. In the concession relief program, uh, there's several paragraphs that basically obligate the concessionaire once they've executed this program and accepted relief um, that their their staffing returns to the August 2001 level as soon as the passenger volume returns to the August 2001 level. We've set up a mechanism where we're able to audit the staffing in August of 2001, and we will be auditing that along the way. If, if the concessionaire does not live up to that, then we withdraw the rent relief that we've given them. So we think we've put a lot of teeth in it with the help of the city council's office. We think we have a good document to protect the workers in that regard. Okay. Uh, that ends the discussion. Madam Clerk, are we ready for a vote? Please open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. That's the same yeah. so. Next item, please. Item number 29, call special by Council Member Garcetti. Mr. Garcetti. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, I know many of you know that one week from tonight we will be meeting in Hollywood. I wanted to let those uh, viewers who watch on Channel 35, and I'm not talking about Nate Holden watching the rerun this evening, um, that we will be meeting at the Kodak Theater in Hollywood at 7 p.m. We encourage members of the public to come to the council. We're bringing the council to the people, just as we did in San Pedro and Wilmington. We'll have the third neighborhood council in our city um, honored. That's the Glassell Park uh, Neighborhood Council, which got the bronze medal 
Um, and I know there's about 96 other neighborhood councils pending. We are, um, also invite members of the public to come from the 13th district, the 4th district, the surrounding areas that will certainly have some business before us, as well as a number of other issues that I think will be of interest to all members of the public. And it's a chance to get into the new home of the Academy Awards and to see that incredible space. So we really encourage folks to, to come there. And this is just a shameless plug. Thanks. <laughs> Mr. Zine. I asked my colleague, Councilmember Garcetti, uh, with parking in that area quite restricted, and they do have a parking facility, is there a way we can make some arrangements for those who will be attending, as some kind of a um, incentive to encourage them? We, we've been looking at uh, trying to get some sort of um, uh, reduction in those costs for this one time, because this is members of the public, and it is the city hall, so we're it's the acting city hall, so we're looking at that. We also encourage um, everybody, and especially those folks coming from downtown, just to get on the red line. Come straight down on the red line to Hollywood, get off right there at Hollywood and Highland, and you can get back on and come back to your cars here at downtown. Thanks. Members of the council, the items are before us. Uh, anyone else wishing to be heard? Seeing no such person, Madam Clerk. Please open the roll. Close the roll. Now tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Thank you very much. Next item is before us. Next item is item number 34, called special in as much as there is an amending motion. All right. Chair recognizes Mr. Padilla. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, quite simply, colleagues, you might have read about this uh, item in the paper. I know the Daily News had covered a proposed uh, Greyhound Depot in the northeast end of the valley. It's in my district, but uh, not too far uh, from the 12th Council District. Uh, this isn't the first time this proposal comes to uh, the 7th District or the city. Uh, there's been previous action by previous councils uh, that were asking the city and the Department of Transportation to come up to speed on. Uh, the amending motion specifically speaks to not just the posting of signage by DOT, uh, but to take the next step on actual enforcement uh, of some weight limitations on uh, streets to protect residential neighborhoods. Uh, and so I ask for your support. Thank you, Mr. Padilla. The chair recognizes Mr. Zine. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, uh, quickly, Councilmember Hahn brought up an issue regarding trucks in uh, the uh, Wilmington, San Pedro area, and I know there were some issues on litigation, some court decisions where enforcement was restricted, if not banned. Do we have to pass some ordinance to have enforcement, or I have some confusion on that, because they said the existing ordinances wouldn't apply anymore. And what you're calling for is an enforcement, which I totally support. Do we need to make some other amendment so we can do that enforcement versus this court decision said we can't? Yeah, I do believe this case is different. We had a meeting uh, not only with uh, building safety and planning and transportation, but the city attorney as well. Uh, and so, so we're we, in the it clear. can be enforced? In this case, yes. Okay, thank you. All right, any other speakers wishing to be heard at this point? Seeing none, that closes the discussion on the matter. Madam Clerk, if you would be kind enough to open the roll. Now close the roll, tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Thank you very much. Next item, please. Next item, Mr. President, uh, special one is motion not on the desk, excuse me, not on the agenda. It's uh, presented by Council Member Reyes, seconded by Council Member Garcetti, and the city attorney will explain the need for the findings. All right, on the findings. Madam City Attorney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this concerns a building uh, at 451 South Bixel. It's a 42-unit multi-family uh, multi apartment building, and it's just come to the attention of the city that the building has been declared uninhabitable, and uh, this is a motion to uh, ask various things in order to uh, help and assist the tenants. And therefore, the council would need to make the finding that the need to act arose after the posting of the agenda, and there is an immediate need to act. And I believe that there is a um, that they're going to be uh, relocating the tenants. Okay. Is there anybody wishing to be heard on the findings? Seeing none, uh, please open the roll on the findings. Close the roll. 
tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Special one is now before us. Mr. Reyes. Thank you, Council. Uh, colleagues, this is one of those cases. If you remember the Palomar building where, we, where a person actually died, perished, it was a mom. This is a situation where we have kids and families who are in danger. The landlord, the slumlord, he's out of the country. Uh, bottom line is this is where we can prevent a catastrophe. We've had several incidents, incidences like this over the years where people have perished because we haven't been able to enforce the law. The city's on top of this. Uh, essentially, this will provide a place for families to move from this location. And uh, essentially, it's winter, it's cold. We can't have people and kids living in the streets. And this will uh, basically prevent a catastrophe from happening. I, I hope I can get a majority support on this. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to be heard? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the roll on special one. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Special one is approved, forthwith. Next item, please. This is the time for comments from the public on items not on the agenda on under council's jurisdiction. And having received no request, the public comment period for today's meeting is closed. Mr. Brinson. Yes, uh, Mr. President, I move that we reconsider uh, the continuation of item number 36 on today's session. That is a closed session item. Uh, request for reconsideration. Please open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Okay. Item 36 shall be heard today. Uh, that is a closed session matter. Let's hold that on the desk. Madam Clerk. Uh, do you wish to close, excuse me, uh, clear the desk before going into closed session? Let's do housekeeping. You have uh, ex uh, motions for posting and referral. Motions are posted and referred. We have an excuse on the desk. Council member uh, Ms. Koski requests to be excused for city business February 26th, 27th, and 29th, and that meet, meets council policy. Ms. Mizikowski is excused. And that clears the desk for closed session. Okay. In conformance with California law, the council will now adjourn into closed session. I ask the guards to please clear the chambers. to open session. Uh, Madam Clerk, next item, please. The desk is clear, Mr. President. Okay, and uh, I believe for the record, item 36 has been continued uh, to Friday, January 18th. Uh, any announcements? Adjourning motions? Please stand. Maybe I might do that, okay? Me? Mr. Brinson? Yeah. Uh, first, I have... Uh, I'd, li I'd ask that we adjourn in favor of Rose Pfefferman, mother to Jerry Pfefferman with the Department of Water and Power and uh, mother-in-law to Elaine in my office in Silmar. Uh, he died seven, seven weeks ago. Oh, the husband died, excuse me. Uh, uh, her husband died seven weeks ago and now Jerry's lost his mother as well. So I'd ask that uh, we ad adjourn in, in her memory. She's uh, survived, survived by her son Jerry and daughter-in-law Elaine and two grandsons. Also, I'd ask like that we... to be a second on that. Yes. I'd ask that we adjourn in memory of Chris Paisano, yeah. mother to Mark Paisano yeah, of Skag, and I think that's probably going to be all members. All members. I uh, survived by two sons, Mark and William, and a daughter, Mary Ann Gardner. So uh, I'd ask that we adjourn in her memory also. Mr. Holden. Mr. President, members, you said to announce to Richard McDermott, McDermott. Passed away January the 11th. Mr. McDermott was the president of the Wilshire Center Chamber of Commerce from 1992 to 98. He was also the chairman of the Wilshire Center Korea Time CRA Citizen Advisory Committee from 93 to 2000. Mr. McDermott provided leadership during some of the some of our community's most trying times. Certainly, he would be missed. 
He's also a longtime employee of Dim Gems. He's one of the officers there, Mr. McDermott. And we work with him on many major projects uh, in and for the good of the city of Los Angeles. Memorial services is scheduled for tonight at uh, St. Th 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 Theresa's, Theresa's Catholic Church in, in Al 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 Alhambra. The family has asked that donation be made to the American Cancer Society in his memory. Ms. Sikowski. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to have the council adjourn in the memory of Myron Weiss. This is a tragic situation. Myron is, was a 19-year-old man from Van Nuys. He was hit by a bus on Ventura Boulevard at Canoga on December 29th outside the whole earth market where he worked. He had recently graduated at Van, from Van Nuys High School and he was planning on going into AmeriCorps for a year. He was active in his community, uh, helped particularly with homeless organizations and with animal adoption groups. He is survived by his parents, Herschel and Gwen Weiss, and his neighbors asked and called and asked if I would adjourn in his memory because they thought he was such a good worker, a good young man, and it's a real tragic loss. Mr. Robertson wants to be a second on that. Mr. Holden. Mr. President, members, that Mr. LaBange has requested to be a second on Mr. McDermott's adjournment motion. Mr. Rudy Thomas. Mr. President, Mr. President, members of the council, I'd ask that we adjourn in memory of Carol Thomas Bill. Mrs. Bill was a 37-year resident of the 8th Council District. She was an active member of the Founders Church of Religious Science, eventually receiving certification as a religious science practitioner. She is survived by her husband, Charles, and her children, Eric and Margaret. And she will be deeply missed in our community. Mr. Weiss. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, I ask that you join me in adjourning in memory of uh, two individuals today. The first is a man who was taken from us far too early. His name was Gerald Magidman. He's a longtime West Side resident, and uh, he was only 59. He's survived by his wife, Diane, his son, David, his daughters, Jody and Casey, and his three grandchildren, as well as his mother, Bernice. I'd also ask that you join me in adjourning in memory of uh, Judge James Colts, who died while we were on recess. Uh, most of my colleagues know him as the uh, gentleman who presided over the Colts Commission, which investigated the Sheriff's Department early in the 1990s. Um, and uh, unlike the Christopher Commission, which was ballyhooed and which had dozens, if not hundreds, of lawyers, the Colts Commission didn't have much staff, didn't have much resources. But you can argue, you can argue that it made an even greater difference on the department that Judge Colts investigated than the department that was the subject of the Christopher Commission investigation. Um, and uh, he, was a, he was a great man and he will be missed. Any others? Mr. Holden wishes a second. No, no. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Thank you very much. This meeting is adjourned. And uh, members, we heard the helicopters a minute ago. I believe the torch is arriving at Alvera Street. If we race over, I think we can still participate in those events. And for those of you watching at home, at 2 p.m., the torch will arrive to the LA Coliseum. And at 7 p.m. tonight, the uh, end of day celebration at uh, Universal City Walk. This meeting is adjourned.